Boom. All right. So today we are going to, like I said, pick up where we left off uh, on Monday, right? We started with where we wrote some Verilog. We installed Verilog on our computers. We're writing code in Notepad, which is disgusting and terrible, but we've got to do it first. Otherwise, we won't appreciate the other stuff. Um, and we're running our, we're executing our simulations in the command line. Today, we're going to sort of port this all over to Visual Studio Code, um, which provides sort of a nice, uh, safe environment for us to work in. That's a little bit prettier, a little bit more use, a little bit more of a normal sort of programming flow. Um, yeah, so let's just go ahead and get right into it, man. Um, let's see. So we did, any questions about what we did last time, by the way? So the tools, iVerilog, GTK Wave are all installed on our, you know, operating system. We can access it from the Windows command line, right, by hitting GTK Wave or, you know, hitting iVerilog. Um, we can write our code in Notepad, and as long as we're in the directory that has the code, then life is good, and we don't have to worry about anything. However, as we've discussed, this is not, you know, for small things, maybe this will work, but for, you know, sort of long, long haul projects, such as the one that you're going to get today, um, well, you want a better environment to work in. And so I use Visual Studio Code, but I first want to point out that you have some options, right? Again, because these tools are on the operating system, they're not in, you know, we're not installing anything on Visual Studio Code, right? You can use whatever you want, right? Um, probably one of the most, or at least a couple of years ago, the most popular one was this one, Atom. It's made by the guys that make GitHub. Um, it's really cool. It's very uh, customizable. Um, you basically start with a clean slate and you just add packages and extensions to it that you want in order to do the things that you want. Um, the really hardcore folks uh, tend to like Atom a lot. I Other people, um, there are still people in the world that use Notepad++. Um, I don't know who these people are and or why they use Notepad++, but they exist. And they use Notepad++ because they're weird. I'm sure some of your CS professors probably still use Notepad++. This is like, Notepad++ is like the boomer atom. Um, let's see. I'm going to say, uh, let's see, another one. One that never gets any love is one called Brackets. It's pretty cool. It's pretty extensible. Yeah, man, that's a hot take, dude. Notepad++ is trash and only old people use it. And I'm saying that as a relative to you guys, old person. Uh, brackets is a good one. Um, it's also pretty extensible. They're trying to compete with the Atom and the VS Codes of the universe. Um, yeah, that's Brackets. Nobody uses Brackets, but some people do, I'm sure. And um, then, of course, I use Visual Studio Code um, because I'm lazy. Basically, all of the stuff that everyone does when they first set up their Atom Sublime text. I forgot all about Sublime text in the last class. I was like, I know I'm forgetting one. Sublime text is also a code editor. Um, it's basically they basically stole brackets and made their own version, or it's vice versa. One of them ripped it off the other, like straight up stole the code base from the other guys. Um, but brackets is, or Sublime text is also an option. Um, go back to Visual Studio Code. I used to use Adam back in the day when I worked for a, a development startup. Because um, that's what everyone that works for a development startup does. They use Atom because it's hip. It's got cool art. Um, but every, every time you install Atom for the first time, you, everyone does like the exact same setup. Visual Studio Code said, like, well, let's just have all of that work out of the box. And that's why I use Visual Studio Code. Um, so I guess I would say um, only like boomers use Notepad++. Lazy millennials like me use VS Code really hip Gen Zers use Atom and just strange people use brackets or sublime text. Um, IntelliJ, IntelliJ is a, an IDE, man. That's, that's its own, that's its own thing. We're talking about extensible code editors. So, and the difference is, so let's see, you guys are probably familiar with Eclipse, right? No, what the hell is that? It's not Eclipse. I'm going to go here. Yeah, like the Eclipse IDE. Yeah, man, I thought I was gonna get a snow day. I'm just, I'm salty about it. So Eclipse um, Visual Studio 2020, is 2020 out? Does it exist? No, it's 2019. Visual Studio 2019, 
Um, Eclipse, IntelliJ. Um, IntelliJ. Did I spell it correctly? Very close. Yeah, there we go. Um, so IntelliJ idea is a an IDE for working in Java. Um, Sublime text is nice. So is bracket. They're all nice. They're all they all type code just nicely. Um, so anyway, but this is a environment that's dedicated for Java, right? It comes fully loaded with the training wheels that let you do the running and the debugging and all that stuff in um, all in the same environment, right? So does Visual Studio Code lets you do that for, or excuse me, Visual Studio lets you do that for like C++ and C Sharp and stuff like that. And it comes with all of the tools like fully loaded, it does debugging, it does all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, Eclipse kind of does those things for whatever you want. Ecl Eclipse is like a weird in-between IntelliJ, Visual Studio, and our code editors. Um, so yeah. So what we're talking about are extensible code editors, not IDEs. So yeah, Sublime Text and Brackets are nice. I mean, look at that. That's a pretty, it's a very attractive user interface. So Sublime Text, that's very nice. It's not as attractive. Um, and we can all just admit that Notepad++ is, is terrible. You shouldn't use it, Aiden. You should be ashamed of yourself. Don't use it, Notepad++. <laughs> I'll never know if you use it or not because the code comes in, but uh, I'll feel it. I'll be like, I, I sense this code was written in Notepad++. It just, it has that Notepad++ smell on it. <laughs> all right, but anyway, I use Visual Studio Code because I like it. It comes preloaded with a bunch of stuff. Um, it's got some, yeah, it's minus 10 just for the smell. Um, but you don't have to use it. You can use whatever one you want. Um, it will not make a difference to what you submit, right? And everything is still gonna run in the command line anyway. So let's go over to Visual Studio Code because that's what I'm gonna do. Um, now a bunch of you guys are gonna use Notepad++ just to like spite me. All right, so here, here's Visual Studio Code. If you use Visual Studio Code, um, you're probably gonna find that like when you start it up, it doesn't quite, you write it on Microsoft Word. I, you know, every semester I have students that submit a .docx file for their Verilog projects. And it's, it's sad. I just hang my head and cry for them. But it does happen. It'll happen this semester. It happens every semester. I don't understand it. I'll even bring it up. I'll say, don't write code in Microsoft Word. That's crazy. But someone's gonna do it because someone is not present right now and probably won't watch this video, and they don't really know what they're doing, and they'll like type their code in. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think you can export MS Paint to a a text file. Like I don't think it works that way. <laughs> Unless you're gonna write some like weird like visual character recognition. Um, nothing's wrong with Word, but the problem is with Word is you don't get text right. At the end of the day, it's just got to be text under the hood. Um, Microsoft Word adds a whole bunch of like, it's like rich text format. It adds a bunch of crazy stuff on it that will make, if you try to like execute code that was written in Word, it won't work because it's got all these like weird headers. There you go. Yeah, so write it by hand and then scan it into a PDF and then convert that to a .v file. <laughs> I mean, English majors write on Microsoft Word. No one writes code, but like I said, there will always be. I mean, this is a freshman class. We get a lot, we get some, we get some, we get some folks in here that um, <laughs> use an Arduino that wires to convert. More. All right, we're getting a little sidetracked. Use whatever text editor you want, as long as your code works. <laughs> I mean, people people will do it, Pamela. Like I, I guarantee you, I will get at least one submission that was written in, in Microsoft Word. Just like it's just like st the force of statistics. In a class consisting of 150 students, there will be at least one who will write their code on Microsoft Word and get a bad grade because <laughs> I can't run a .docx file. It takes all kinds. Okay, we're getting way distracted. Okay, so here is Visual Studio Code. Um, as I was going to say, I have some customizations on here on my own. Um, so, for example, it's got this nice blue color that I really like. Um, Yours won't, won't look like that, but that's just because I have my own extensions and my own customizations here. Um, but it's got this sort of sidebar menu where we can view our files, right? So here are the files that we were working with. Um, 
Visual Studio Code also has this handy thing where I can like click and drag and I can put one file over here so I can like have my module and my test bench like right next to each other. Oh, you guys probably wanna see the thing, right? Yeah. Sorry, I gotta like operate the switchboard as well. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So like I said, we've got our, all our files here. Um, like I said, I can move stuff around. I can put like, I can do all kinds of weird stuff. I can put them like on top of each other. I don't know. But you can move around so I can view my stuff at the same time. Let me close that. We can also just open up and look at, here's what the VVP file looks like. The simulation file that gets generated by iVerilog. Looks weird and crazy. The, the, the waveform file actually kind of makes a little bit of sense if you stop and like really look at it. Um, but yeah, but it's all there. So let's see, there's only one thing we're missing and that is, well actually I take it back. Before we do that, another thing I really like about Visual Studio Code is um, you can install this on Atom or the other editors, but not Notepad++. If you use Notepad++, then you're stuck with using the vanilla command line in Windows. Whereas if you use Visual Studio Code, it has a terminal built into it so I can pop up and open a command line right here in VS Code so I can type my commands directly. But another thing too is whatever folder, like whatever file you have open, when you open the command line, um, it will automatically navigate you to that folder, right? So you don't have to do any navigating around. You're already there, already ready to do this stuff. And we can type the commands. I verilog option O circuit.v, or excuse me, circuit.vbp, circuit underscore tb.v, this is the same thing we did last time. All right, vvp, circuit.vvp, right, creates a dump file, gtk wave, circuit.vcd, look, I can open gtk wave right there inside Visual Studio Code to, you know, view all that good stuff. So another reason why and Visual Studio Code does that out of the box whereas with Adam you got to add a package that does these things so um, the only thing we're missing now is notice that everything is still sort of white um, and it's not very attractive to look at so what you need to do is ins install a syntax highlighting extension for Visual Studio Code so I'm gonna go over to extensions I'm gonna type in Verilog well, notice that I'm gonna get a bunch of options here right Anytime you're looking for a package or a dependency or anything, it's always, if you don't know specifically what you're looking for, the rule of thumb you should always use is install the one that everybody else is also installing. Like let the community vet them for you. So for example, this one has 8,000. So you can see right here how many installs it has. This one has 8,000. This one has 6,700. This one has 2,500. This one has 1,700, 8,800, 1,000. 3,000, this one only has 400. We're probably gonna stay away from that one. Um, this one has 6,000, this one has 800. We will also probably stay away from that one. Um, this one right here though, has 150,000. So you can bet which one we are going to use. And it's gonna be this one. Um, this one is very like, some of these other ones will work and you can use them. Again, this is just syntax highlighting. This is not we're not installing Verilog. We're not going to run Verilog from this. This literally is just going to take and put the pretty colors on top of Verilog. Um, so I'm just going to hit install. And installed. The extension is enabled globally. And then if I go over back to my circuit testbench.v, hey, look at that. It's all prettified. It's got the colors. It does the stuff. Everything is nice. So any questions about firing up Visual Studio Code and acquiring that syntax highlighting. This is where the Notepad++ guys say, uh, but Notepad++ has syntax highlighting for Verilog out of the box. You don't have to install an extension. <laughs> You're right, but that's the only thing it has. So it's from, you go over to the side menu right here. So that question was, how do I find the extension? So there's like the file explorer, there's like a search thing. There's, if you're using version controlling, there's a Git repository deal. There's a debugging menu, but there's also an extensions menu. And literally all I did was just type, I went to the extensions menu, typed in Verilog in the search bar, went to that one, the one that has a lot of downloads and downloaded that one.
give me just a second. I'm gonna request a ride home. Cool. So any questions about that? All right. So now let's go ahead and let's do something meaningful, right? We've got about 30 minutes left. And uh, what I want to do is work through a sort of complete example, right? We're going to start with a truth table and we'll go all the way to a test bench and make sure that that's working properly. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up one note. Let's make that full screen. Get my tablet over here. Okay, so let's go ahead and design a circuit, and I'll just kind of arbitrarily make one up here. Let's make it a circuit of three variables, A, B, and C, and let's give it an output Y. So let's just list out all of the inputs, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, one zero zero one zero one 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 zero one 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 and let's see let's go zero one zero one one zero one zero the one in the eleven o'clock session came out kind of weird let's see what this one comes out as so there we go so there is y it's our truth table. We're going to take this and we're going to put it in Verilog. So the first thing we need to do is actually design, we want to design our circuit first by hand, right? We want to say, all right, first we need the midterm expansion. So Y is a function of A, B, and C. And is equal to the sum of midterms, what, 1, 3, 4, and 6. One, three, four, and six. Yeah. And let's go ahead and use a K map to work it out. One. So we'll set up our three variable K map here. Like so. We'll say we got Y, we got A, we got B and C, we got zero, we got one, we got zero, zero, we got zero, one, we got one, one, we got one, zero, and then we got ones at one, three, four, and six. Hey, this one's gonna work out kind of nicely. All right, so we've got, let's see, we can group these two terms. So this first one, we'll get a y as a function of a, b, and c, and is equal to what a prime and c or next up we can group these top ones and the bottom one together. That's gonna get us what A um, and C prime. Well, did we make an XOR by accident here? A and C, A prime and C, A and C prime. So this is technically an XOR gate, um, but we're not gonna do it that way. All right. So let's see, the last thing we need to do, once we have this, now we could take this and put this into Verilog directly, right? We could actually code that using some techniques. 
Um, but I'm going to do it with the by drawing the logic circuit and implementing the logic circuit directly just to illustrate some points, right? So this is going to consist of two AND gates. Let's feed you an OR gate. Gets us an output Y, A prime and C, or A and C prime. Now, in the example we did before, we only really had one gate. We had inputs into a logic gate into an output, right? And that worked just fine. But the thing is, now we have these wires. that connect the outputs of the AND gates to the inputs of the OR gate. And we're going to need, we're going to, need to define those in Verilog. So I'm going to go ahead and actually give them names. I'm going to call this wire 0, and I'm going to call this guy wire 1. So we need to account for the outputs of all of our logic gates individually. So now that we have this structure, well, first, are there any questions about how we got to this place? We had the truth table, we did the generalized midterm expansion, we did the K-mat, we got the expression, we drew the logic diagram. Now we're ready to put it into Verilog. Okay. You know, actually, before we do that, let's do this real quick. We need to have some definitions for our wires. So let's just say that wire 0 is equal to A prime and C. And wire 1 is equal to A and C prime. And that means that Y is equal to wire 0 or wire 1. So really, it's this that we'll be implementing in Verilog. Okay, so let's go ahead and build it. So let's go ahead and create a new file. Let's call it creatively circuit two dot v, and let's put all the stuff in it. So we need a module. Circuit 2, it has inputs A, B, C, and an output Y. Remember that in the parameters listing, we don't care about inputs versus outputs. And we're going to end the module. And in here, we'll have our inputs, our outputs, then our wires, then our logic circuit implementation. So we have an input A, an input B, an input C. We have an output Y. And now we have a wire, wire 0, and a wire for wire 1. So we define our wires um, explicitly, just like we would for an input or an output. Now we do our logic circuit implementation. Again, we're just doing you know, this bit that's boxed right here, defining wire 0, wire 1, and then y is the OR gate. So wire 0, or excuse me, we assign wire 0 equal to, what did we have, A prime or, excuse me, A prime and C. In Verilog, the not is the tilde, so not A and C. So the important take home there is not A, A prime is tilde A. Assign Y1 equals A and not C. And then finally, assign y is equal to wire 0 or, we use the vertical bar for or, we're already doing that, wire 1. 
And there we go. There is our entire Verilog module for our circuit. And as we kind of alluded to, for a circuit that's as simple as this, um, we could have also just done this. We could have done a sine y equals, in parentheses, not a and c, or a and c, not c, just like that. This would have worked just as well, um, especially for, for so, especially for something as small as this. I probably would have gone this route, um, but I wanted to illustrate the whole business of using wires to connect up everything. So I'm gonna leave that there, but I'm gonna comment it out. That is our Verilog implementation. Are there any questions about that? Some folks are typing. How do you do the tilde? It's the, I mean, it's the tilde key. So you hold, what's well, the apostrophe? Remember, it's the same one for the apostrophe, but it's, you know, shift apostrophe gets you tilde. This one says, so we use tilde for not? Yep, you're absolutely correct. You know, in C, it's, you know, exclamation point. But here we use tilde. Can you tilde on the other side of the variable's input? Um, I don't think so, but I've never tried it. So you're saying, could you do something like this, like A tilde? Um, I don't think so, but I've, I've never actually tried that, so I don't, I don't know. Maybe we'll test it out and see if that works. Okay, so let's keep it moving. Let's go ahead and make our test bench. So circuit two underscore TB dot V. I'm gonna bring it, let me do this actually. I'm gonna bring you over here. And then we'll work on our test bench. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. So let's do our test bench. The first things we need are, remember those time scales. So time scale, one nanosecond slash one nanosecond. And we need to include our folder or file that we're testing, circuit2.v, and it's module circuit2 underscore tb. It has no inputs or outputs, so we just put a semicolon, and then in module. And let's put our boilerplate stuff up here. Oh, actually, I'll take that back. We're not there yet. So we still need our inputs, our outputs, and our unit under test and our simulation and our test execution. So remember for inputs we use regs, so reg A, reg B, reg C. Outputs are wires, wire Y. Now remember since the wires in our module are internal, right? They're internal to that module. So in our test bench, we don't need to consider them. We're only interested in the inputs and the outputs. We're not gonna mess with the um, internal signals. So let's say our unit under test is our circuit two module, UUT, and we'll tie everything in A, B, C, D, semicolon. And now our test execution, initial, begin, and end. So now we wanna kind of work our way through the truth table, right? You know, we wanna go all the way from sort of top to bottom here. We wanna go from zero to seven and look at zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero. So to do that, the way we did it last time, we would have to do this, right? A equals zero, B equals zero, C equals zero, and then let's say, let's wait for 10. And then, all right, then C equals one, and then wait for 10, and then let's say, all right, well then B equals one, and then C equals zero, right? And this gets kind of, oop, you're right. It should be A, B, C, Y. 
That's what I get for going fast, right? Now this gets kind of weird and unruly. So there's a more concise syntax that we can use to do that. And that's going to look like this. I'm going to wrap in curly braces. There is a place for curly braces in Verilog. It's right here. And I'm going to say A, B, and C is equal to. What this does, it's called vector notation or bus notation. And what it does is it takes those one bit values and it says, well, let's just treat it as one three bit signal. So what I can do here is say, set that equal to the three bit. So the first number is how many bits, then, an, then a single quote, then a B for binary, or we could do D for decimal or H for hex. But let's do B for binary right now, zero, zero, zero and a semicolon. And then for conciseness, I also like, since we're always gonna delay a little bit after we change values, I do semicolon and then the, my delay and then a semicolon again, and I'll do that all on one line. So what that does is it says, we're gonna put zero in A, zero in B, and zero in C. And then we can copy and paste. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and all we have to do is update our stuff, three, four, five, six, and seven. So there we go. We've sort of cycled our way through all of the input values for the truth table. And the last thing we need to do is add our sort of boilerplate. Remember, we need to create our waveform file. So dump file, circuit2.vcd. Dump vars zero circuit two TB and at the end we need to say that we're finished and now we're ready to run our simulation. Are there any questions about the test bench that we just wrote? Dump vars, don't worry about it, man. Just um, to say that's Verilog's way of saying these are the, where we're going to get the variables to um, to put in our waveform. And it's always just going to be the same thing as the test bench module itself. Other than that, you don't really need to worry about what that means. Just know that you got to use it. Okay, so now let's go ahead and run the simulation. Clear. Um, let's see. So I Verilog option O circuit two dot VVP from circuit two underscore TB dot V. Didn't get any errors, so we bet we're all good. VVP to run the simulation circuit two dot VVP. Now we've got a dump file. Now I'm going to say GTK wave circuit two dot VCD. And now we got some stuff. Oh, that's <laughs> stupid. I accidentally opened the circuit one. Circuit two. Um, Pamela asks, how did I open the PowerShell? Let me close it real fast. There's two ways to do it. The first one is just up here at the top under terminal and say new terminal and it will open up a new terminal for you and it will automatically be in the folder that you've got open in Visual Studio Code. Another way to do it is just to hit uh, control tilde. So that would be control plus single quote. You type that in, that will automatically, that sort of lets you toggle the terminal. It's because it is superior, Joshua. I'm glad you are a believer now. Can't do that in Notepad++. Can I do all the commands again? Yeah, I'll do all the commands again. Oh, another thing we may have talked about in almost all terminals or command lines, um, if you just type, if hit the up key, it will like cycle back through your history. So I can go back up to iVerilog option O, 
circuit2.vvp, circuit2 underscore tb.v. And then the next one has to be vvp, circuit2.vvp. So the first one is this, this one basically does the compiling. So it compiles the simulation and checks for syntax errors. This next line actually runs the simulation and generates the waveform file. And then the last one is we want to view, we want to run GTK wave to view the waveform file, circuit2.vcd. So let's kind of take a look at it. And right now we can kind of see that it, when you see everything is green, usually that's a good sign, right? Um, when you screwed stuff up, you're going to see red lines and blue lines and all kinds of weird stuff. When everything is green, that means you're like 80% of the way to the right answer. Um, it means you haven't screwed anything up in a bad, bad way. Your logic might be messed up, but at least nothing else will be wrong here. Okay, so let's kind of look at these side by side. Um, so we have our truth table, and we wanted for midterm zero, it should be zero, and then one, and then zero, then one, one, zero, one, zero. And thankfully, we did 10 nanosecond steps. Yeah, what's up? Did you already do the include? All right, here, I will make all of it fit in one. So here we go, we should be able to see, take a minute and look at both of these and see if you have any syntax errors. Also, don't forget to save your files. Um, this actually gets a lot of people. So for example, I made a change. Notice there's a little white dot up here. Um, that means the file isn't saved. And if you don't save the file, even in the beginning, there won't be anything in it and you'll get those no top level modules. So for example, if you wrote all of this, but didn't actually save it, then when you go to run the test bench, it won't do it. Do you guys have it working now? Yes, Aaron, that's correct. So Jen, did you remember the semicolon up here? All right, Pamela. We got, we got it. No, we don't have a lot of time. Um, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to file this under the um, – we need to move forward to do some other things. Um, but I've, don't forget I've got my office hours today. So we can, we can address the issues that you're having sort of one-on-one -on -one during my office hours.
All right. So I'm going to go ahead and do what I was doing, which is we're going to look at the test bench output and compare it to our truth table, right? We did 10 nanosecond delays so that each of these columns is actually going to conveniently correspond to our min terms. So when A is, so A, B, C are 0, 0, 0, Y is 0. Look at the truth table. That's good. 0, 0, 1 should be Y equals 1. That's good. 0, 1, 0 should be Y equals 0. That's good. Um, next one, 0, 1, 1 should be Y equals 1. That's good. 1, 0, 0 should be Y equals 1. That's good. And I'm just sort of clicking through and I'm looking over here on the left hand side to see where stuff is going. Um, and then let's see, 1, 0, 1 should be 0, and it is. Then 1, 1, 0 should be 1, and it is. And 1, 1, 1 should give us y equals 0, and it sure does. So that's how we take a look at the output there. Um, um, individual sort of syntax error issues aside, does anyone have a question about sort of taking, about looking at this waveform and, and comparing it to the truth table? Um, here, Edward, let me throw those up for you. These three commands right here. Um, and then Adrian asks, are we going to be given the initial delays? Um, what do you mean by given the initial delays? Um, no, so one, you should always use this, right? The time scale, one nanosecond slash one nanosecond. Um, on the projects that I give you for this class, all you're gonna turn in is your module, right? You're gonna give me your module.v file. I'm going to have my own test bench that is gonna have its own stuff going on and it's gonna automatically sort of run all of the, t in all of the possible test cases um, and basically provide a score for you. So I will run my own test bench, so I'll worry about these things on my own. For the record though, I always just use 10 nanoseconds. I always use one nanosecond up here and 10 down here is what I use for everything. Um, so you can use it. I will also give you, uh, I'm gonna post uh, your first project this afternoon. I just need to finish writing my test bench. And in addition to the prompt, I'm also gonna give you the test bench that I'm going to use to grade you. So you'll be able to see how yours um, performs you know, in real time. So there's really no excuse for you not to get 100 on the projects because you'll have the test bench that I'm going to grade you on available to you to test with. So um, let's see. We've only got a few minutes left, and I want to finish this up. There's a, one, a couple things I want to show you. Do you press anything when GTK first wave first opens? Mine's blank. Yeah, you have to. So when you fire up GTK wave, you got to come over here to you know, click on your circuit and then pick the signals you want and then hit append and that dumps all the signals into GTK wave. I think there's some options for when you do this command that will actually do that for you automatically. I just don't know them off the top of my head. Okay, a couple things. I'm gonna go kind of fast. Um, so it was easy for us here since it was only three inputs, an eight row truth table, for us to go through the line and sort of see what's, you know, to go look at the waveform and know that it's working properly. But a lot of times you wanna actually be able to, it'd be nice if you could have your test bench do that for you. Um, we'll do a little bit more detailed stuff on Friday, but for today what I wanna show you is that you can output some stuff with the display command. So I'm gonna say display, y equals 
I'm gonna use the modulo operator and then B for binary. So it'll display the binary value here of Y and then comma Y. Um, this sort of syntax, this um, like string placeholder or string interpolation syntax is pretty common to a lot of languages. If you've been working with C or C++, um, you're probably already familiar with this type of syntax, but this will just let us see the values of Y. And so I'll come here and just sort of copy these guys all the way down. And then now I need to resynthesize my test bench. So I'll run iVerilog again, but now if I run VVP, now it will actually output and show me the results for Y. On Friday, we'll get a little bit more sophisticated and we'll show that you know you can actually do an if statement here to compare it against a known value so you can do your tests automatically. Um, let's see, one last thing. Also, instead of having to write a whole bunch of stuff, there's two things I wanna do, right? Instead of doing the binary, you, we could have also done decimal. So I could change B to D and say decimal zero, decimal one, decimal two, decimal three, decimal four, decimal five, decimal six, decimal seven. And what this says is, it says, hey, this is in base 10, so it's in decimal, so that's why I can use five, six, seven, and so on. But the number on the other side here, the three says, it's still three bits. So it's still gonna work out properly. So if I were to run that again, yep, that's what I'm gonna show you next you know, we can see that we get the same thing. And now the last thing there he just mentioned was, could you do a for loop? Yeah, you can do a for loop. The first thing we need to do is define an integer variable to hold the value in our for loop. First thing I'm gonna do is just comment this out so that we still have it, but we're not gonna execute that. And so what I can do now is this. Uh, Joshua asks, is there any reason to keep the VCD VVP, VVP, yeah, VVP files that we generate after we're done working on a test bench or is it fine to delete those? No, you can delete those. Those are just extra. Um, so I can do a for loop. I can say for i equals zero, i less than eight, i plus plus. And remember, no curly braces, but instead begin and end. And I can say that a, b, c, is equal to um, i delay 10 and let's add my delay there and now if i run that it works all the same so here we can use a for loop to do the exact same thing. The only trick is you gotta, I think, I don't know, let me try this real fast. I think you have to define the integer outside, but I don't know that for sure. Nope, maybe not. So you can define the integer there in the expression. All right, there we go, that is 150. So here we've seen how to start from top to bottom, right? We went from having a truth table to getting the generalized midterm expansion, doing the K-map, getting the logic diagram, or getting the minimum solution, getting our logic diagram, implementing it in Verilog, and then writing a test bench for it. And we did some things to kind of make our test benches a little bit easier to look at. Cool. All right. If there is nothing else, um, that is all I have for you guys today. Um, I will upload your first Verilog project to Blackboard this afternoon as soon as I've finished writing the test bench for it. Um, we'll talk about it in detail on Friday. We'll go over a few more extra things on Friday, and then we'll kind of move on. We'll pick up in Chapter 11 of the textbook um, on Monday. So if there's nothing else, I will see you guys on Friday. Thank you.